Welcome to Winescapes with Artists. I'm Deborah Klotchko, Executive Director and Chief Curator for the Museum of Photographic Arts. And raise a glass, cheers, um, and thank you for joining us for today's guest. We have Andy Grunberg, um, well-known art critic, writer, curator, and he's here to share his new upcoming book with us, How Photography Became Contemporary Art, which is coming out with Yale University Press. And Andy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Deborah. It's a pleasure to um, be able to chat. Well, from a social uh, distance, from a, social distance, a safe social distance. Um, so you're well known for so many things. Um, you're the author of Crisis of the Real, which included a selection of your essays when you were the uh, photography critic for the New York Times. Um, you've curated exhibitions. You've also won numerous awards, uh, an Infinity Award from the International Center for Photography, a Leica Medal for Excellence in Writing. Um, and we're here to talk about how photography became contemporary art. And I thought, well, I have a couple of questions to start out with. Um, why now? Um, why is this book coming out at this point in time? What, what um, brought you to this moment? Well, I guess I should make clear from the start that the, the book deals with a certain historical period, um, which is centered on the 70s and the 80s, even though the book starts in the 60s and continues into the 90s. The bulk of it is about those two decades. And I had the sudden realization that this is getting to be 50 years ago, half a century, and fewer and fewer people in the world um, can remember this or even comprehend what happened then. And from my years at teaching at the Corcoran College of Art and Design, I became acutely aware that students today, kids in their teens or people in their 20s, have no idea about photography's one-time sort of uh, also ran second cousin status in the art world and just kind of assume that photography has always been as as accepted within art as it as it is now but in fact it was during the 70s and the 80s when a transition happened where photography was an outlier in contemporary art sort of had its own idea of itself as a as an art form and it wasn't until artists got really interested in photography and there became a interchange between artists who were trained in other media who became interested in photography and photographers who were increasingly paying attention to what was happening in the art world that this sort of synergy took place. So you're approaching this um, really not as a historian, but as someone who had firsthand experience. Um, how, how does that change the approach you took and um, how people will respond to this, uh, this book? Well, that's right. The, the nominal subtitle of the book is A Critic's Account. Um, even though I've taught art history and have some claim to be um, an art historian, the, the fact of the matter is my, my account is really based on my own perspective. So the book, you might say, is part art history and part memoir, since I was in the, in the photography world when all this was happening. I, couldn't really leave myself out. So it's a, a kind of combination of things that were happening that I might have learned about later and things that I actually experienced firsthand. So given that, I have to make clear that it's very New York centric because I was living in Manhattan during those decades. It's um, based on what I saw or what was being shown in galleries. So there, you could say that there are some people on the margins of the art world that deserve more credit than they've gotten that are not emphasized in the book because I'm basically paying attention to what I was, I'm recounting what I was paying attention to at the time. 
So can you talk a little bit about your education, your background, and, and um, sort of how, the, how your relationship with photography and, and contemporary art began? Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of, a, not a strange story, but a, a story of a lot of, of coincidences. Um, I actually was, was trained or went to graduate school in creative writing, and my intention when I got to New York in 1971 was to be a poet. Um, I really admired a lot of what were called the New York School of, of Poetry Poets, and um, had an ambition to be a writer. At the same time, I'd gotten interested in photography on my own, partly because my father was always this avid snap shooter, and he gave me one of his cameras at a certain point. So I, so I became interested in the visuals sort of as a sideline to you know, reading books and writing and all the kind of literary things that I, were, I was doing. And in retrospect, I have to say, it makes a certain amount of sense that since I was interested in writing and I was interested in photography, that what I would end up in my career doing is writing about photography. But at the time when this was all happening, I had, I had no big plan. It, it, it was, a, it was a, a different period than today where, where you know, kids out of college have to sort of have a clear idea about where their, where their next move is going to be and what kind of vocation they're going to have. We, we were very uh, loosey-goosey at the time. It was, it was the end of the 60s, which, um, and, you know, the 60s actually ended in the 70s. And, <laughs> and it was just a, 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 a time of a lot of upheaval and experimentation and, you know, crazy things going on that you just got used to. And, and that's part, part of the story is like how much the art world changed in that period as a result of artists being dissatisfied with the status quo and starting to look at other ways of making art. And one of the other ways of making art that they found was photography. Well, and it also seems to me that your time at Cornell University uh, was impactful. Uh, we have some slides to share and maybe you could talk about those. Well, actually, okay. um, the first one we have you. Well, the in... first one's when I arrived in New York. That's yes. just a, uh, that's a little comic interlude, let's say. <laughs> um, well, it's working. It... <laughs> the, the, the poet as a young executive, I guess we yes. call that. Um, in any case, the, the next slide that we have is, is Robert Smithson's Ithaca Mir Mir Trail, which is a, a piece consisting of eight photographs and a map in the middle. And, and the map basically describes where Smithson took these photographs. Smithson, of course, is a famous earth artist, most famous for Spiral Jetty. But before he did Spiral Jetty, he was part of a show called Earth Art at Cornell, which actually gave the movement its name. Um, and, I, and it happened while I was there. I was a senior in 1969 when Smithson and other artists like Dennis Oppenheim and Jan Dibbett um, came to campus and did in situ pieces. And Smithson pieces piece involved placing mirrors in the landscape from the thing that he was most interested in was the Cayuga salt mine. So he'd actually gone down in the mine, in the mine with mirrors and taking pictures there. But then th this particular piece documents sort of a trail that he made between the salt mine and the campus museum, um, which was at the, was then the Andrew Dixon White House, um, which is where I saw this show. And it, having taken art history by this point, you know, I, I knew art up to Warhol, I think was where the course ended. But the idea that like, photographs of a mirror in a bunch of snow could constitute art in some way was totally befuddling to me. So I got, instead of being repelled by this, which could be one reaction, I was actually fascinated and intrigued and started to think about maybe I should learn more about this. So did you get to experience the actual installations or was it really only through the, the photographic documentation that you saw the work? 
Well, I saw the show in the museum, mm-hmm. and there was some construction outside the museum that was going on that I saw beforehand, but I did go in the museum, and it was just some things that had sort of looked like they'd been thrown together. There were piles of dirt. There was a pile of, of um, what turned out to be asbestos. <laughs> There were um, there was grass growing and there were rows of photographs like Smithson's photographs. He showed photographs in the gallery as the kind of equivalent of what his work was outside. The, like, what people then end up arguing about is like, well, is the work actually the site and you have to be there, or is it the photographs which are the documentation? of the site. And Smithson had a neat way of talking about this. He referred to site and non-site. So the site would always be where he went out and did work. And then the non-site was the gallery where this work would be displayed in a kind of secondhand or or artifactual way. Mm -hmm. So So anyway, so I did get to see the show, but it was was as equally befuddling as as this piece of work. um, So in the next slide, we have um, Gordon Mata Clark splitting right. the this house. Is piece, this is a piece from the 70s, so this is after Cornell. But I, I okay. was a friend of Gordon Mata Clark's at Cornell. He was studying architecture when I was there studying English literature, and um, he had helped out different artists that were making these installations for the Earth Art Show. And he got really interested in what they were doing and their so- whole sort of aesthetic of working both in in the in situ in the environment and in a kind of large scale way. And so he later came back to New York, and when I arrived, he was already there. Um, introduced me to Soho, where he was a major figure in the very early days of, of Soho becoming the center of contemporary art. And he started doing works that were like this one, which is a house in Englewood, New Jersey, that uh, the these art supporters, Holly, Holly and Horace Solomon had bought this house for him. It was about to be torn down. And he removed parts of the foundation on one side of the house chainsawed a slice through the entire house and then let the house settle, one side of the house settle back down. Um, So it's a house split in two, which is not the usual way we try to build shelters. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So this is kind of a, this is, this is a great example of him combining his architecture school training with his interest in art in the same way that I ended up combining my, my sort of English criticism training with the visual art of photography and lots of other things too. So can we have the next slide? So you talk about uh, exhibitions being important during this time as well in this in transition to con- uh, photography to contemporary art. Uh, we have the new topographics from the Eastman House on view right now. Right. So. So when I moved to New York, I finally, I quickly realized that uh, being a poet wasn't going to pay the rent. So I ended up having a series of jobs, which in 1974 ended up, I I got to be picture editor of Modern Photography Magazine. And even though most of the magazine was dedicated to the latest cameras and lenses and other equipment, it was interested enough in photography as a, as a, you know, visual material that it would send me around to places. So in 1975, it sent me to two shows at the George Eastman House. Um, this is actually the second one, New Type of Graphics, but this is the one that then becomes, um, let's say, world famous, or at least extremely well known later in the art world as, as a kind of demonstration of photography's art potentials at its finest. And um, it was controversial at the time, but has since sort of inquired, acquired a legendary status. The f- photographers that people may know of included Robert Adams, 
Louis Baltz, Stephen Shore, Nicholas Nixon, they've all become extremely well known. Um, and then there were these, this pair of artists from Germany who most people in the photography world hadn't heard of at the time, named Bern and Hilla Becker, or Becher, B-E-C-H-E-R. Um, and the, the Beckers were photographing industrial structures like water towers and mm -hmm. um, steel, steel plants and coal machinery and making these what they call typologies in, in grids. Um, mm. They're not they're not illustrated here, but this is what you see in this picture is actually Louis Baltz's series called the New Industrial Parks of Irvine at Irvine, California. Not that far from San Diego. No, um, not far at all. So, so what happened was this is a, a great example of an early interchange or crossover between artists who were being exhibited in art galleries because the, the, the Beckers were showing at Sonnabend in Soho in New York starting in 1971, and artists who were more well-known in, in the photography world but were starting to attract attention in the art world. So Baltz's pictures that you see here actually end up being displayed at about the same time at Leo Castelli's gallery, which is one of the most prestigious contemporary galleries. So suddenly photography, which prior to this period was really, you know, on it, in its own universe. There was a art world and then there was a photography world. And at this point, new topographic sort of becomes the, the, uh, the hallmark of what, of when this happens is, is that there starts to be this interchange between the photography world and the art world. And, and the, it expands the potentials of how the medium gets used and expands the interest in photography, both among artists and among people that are trained as photographers, but now see photography in a different way. So you had mentioned that when this opened, it, there, it was controversial. What were some of the controversies? This transition into more of a conceptual approach or the fact that photography was suddenly beginning to change? Well, it was, it was I, I guess the easiest way to say it was, it was a stylistic change that people were unprepared for, mm -hmm. that, that the, the idea of a classic great landscape photography was more on the order of Edward Weston or Ansel Adams, something, something that was beautiful. And what these photographers were photographing was, you know, decrepit mining equipment, mm -hmm. anonymous looking storage buildings in an in a industrial park, um, suburbs on the, on the front range of the uh, Rockies in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those things that you would think of as being eyesores, they were taking pictures of, and they were taking them in this kind of eerily neutralized, uninflected way. So it, it seemed like they maybe didn't care about what they were photographing. But then, as they pointed out, it's like, if you photograph something, you must care about it. So, so people were, were unprepared for the kind of... Um, just neutral style that these photographers presented. It's amazing how fresh this work still feels today, um, considering well, that this is 1975. It's a lot of play and it's included in a lot of, of you know, work, shows and exhibitions that look at that period. Mm -hmm. So important. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Well, so one of the points I make is that it, it wasn't just the practice of photography that was then propelling the medium into the forefront of the consciousness of contemporary art, but it was also writing and, and theory and what we probably could call criticism about photography. Suddenly there were many people interested in writing about photography where before it had been mostly photographers who wrote about photography. So this is a, a panel that happened at the Corcoran Gallery of Art when um, it was showing a show of Sam Wagstaff's collection, mm -hmm. and it had a it had a symposium called Photography. Where are we now? Um, and it it, it was uh, organized by Jane Livingston, who's seated on the left, who was the chief curator of the Corcoran Gallery. And this is the the second day. It had it had a lot of luminaries included on these different panels, but this was the panel specifically about criticism on the second day 
um, featured Joel Schneider from the University of Chicago, Susan Sontag, who had just, this was in 78, she had just um, released her essays on photography as, as a book in 1977 called On Photography, which everyone was reading. Mm -hmm. And then Rosalind Krauss, who had founded October magazine and wrote a whole lot about photography using as her basis French critical theory um, that, around, that was derived from a semiotic or structural linguistics point of view. And then Hilton Kramer is representing the establishment. He was the chief art critic for the New York Times, and he often wrote about photography. So what they're all gathered here trying to decide is whether Photography is sui generis, was what the title of the panel was, which is, is it is photography its own little art, or is it part of something else? And of course, they never got around to answering that, but it was, that was the, that was more or less the, the crucial question of the day. Mm -hmm. Was photography what John Tchaikovsky called it a different kind of art, which is to say it didn't correspond to anything that was happening in painting and sculpture and those realms, or was photography part of a bigger picture of representation, which is what people like Sontag and Krauss would have argued. So leave anything out on that? No, that was, that, let's go to the next slide. Okay, all right. So Bomb Magazine, um, Richard so this Prince's, is just the reproduction mm -hmm. from a magazine of a Richard Prince piece, which is actually in color, but it's reproduced in color in my book. But um, this is a, this is just to show you this that in this is from 19. The magazine was published in 1980, even though the picture's from 78. But in terms of photography dealing with representation, this gave birth to a whole generation of artists who emerged in the late 70s and dominated throughout the 80s that we now know as picture artists. Um, at the time, they were more likely to be called postmodernists because this whole critical theory was based on the idea that, that modernism, as we knew it in art and everything else in culture, was over and had been replaced or superseded by something that critiqued modernism and supplanted it. And in Prince's case, what that meant was he didn't go off and photograph things in the world he looked through magazines and found advertisements that appealed to him, and he photographed them. So he was actually photographing other photographs, which is why he called what he did re-photography. Um, but it's now come to be known as appropriation, which means that you take somebody else's work and re refigure it or just reproduce it, and it becomes your own. Mm -hmm. um, I think that sort of copyright issues are less important than the idea behind this, which is, as Prince said, it seemed to him that there were enough pictures in pictures in the world already. He didn't need to make any new ones. So it's this sensation that we're all living in this world that's full of images. And if we really want to be photographing the world, part of what we could be photographing is the images that we're always seeing in the world. And, and, looking at them critically. So in, what Prince was doing was saying, gee, isn't this weird that all these advertisements have guys in suits that are all sort of pondering off to the side of the frame? Like, what's what's over there, <laughs> over mm -hmm, their left mm -hmm. shoulder? Um, so he was interested in kind of the, identifying the kind of repetitions and mythologies that that, that get reproduced in the mass media. And, and the pictures generation artists generally were fascinated with mass media. They were fascinated with television, film. Well, it's you know, interesting. Advertising, billboards, everything like that was all yeah. fodder for them. So it's interesting to see with, with the digital world that we live in now, how many artists are, in a sense, doing the same thing. They're looking at all of those countless images and reappropriating them in a variety of different ways, whether it's capturing uh, Google views or um, images of sunsets from everybody's uh, uploaded snapshots. Um, the technology opportunities have changed, but the, the, some of the ideas that are coming out at this time are still in use today. 
Oh, definitely. I mean, if you're thinking of Penelope Umbrico, who mm -hmm. I think you are, um, or Mike Mandel and, and um, oh, I'm going to murder her name or forget her name, but um, they, they did a, a book which was um, pictures that were posted online when the Boston Marathon bombing happened. And so there's, there's lots of ways in which artists now are enjoying the fruits of this, uh, of, of a image world that's just since, since these pictures were made in the, in the late 70s and early 80s by the postmodernists, the, that the world has just become more and more full of pictures. And, and the idea of photography is this unlimited archive of, of visual experience has just become more and more obvious. Okay, let's move on to the next image. Oh, good. So oh, yes. <laughs> here you are with oh, Cindy this Sherman. Just, mm -hmm. This is this is the author, me and Cindy, at the opening of her first retrospective, which was at the Akron Art Museum in um, I think 1984, which was rather early for an artist to have a retrospective. People were complaining that. Mm -hmm. They were giving teenagers retrospectives in museums now, but um, she wasn't a teenager. But it, it's just an indication that I was I was in the the thick of this because by this time I was writing criticism for the New York Times. I had started there in 1981 after having cut my teeth at the Art in America and the Soho Weekly News. And cut your and, hair. And I got a better haircut. Yeah. Um, I'm not too sure about the seersucker jacket, but be that as it may, the the idea is that I wanted to show is just that I, that I became part of the scene of what was happening in photography, and its and its kind of influence went from New York, which is where I knew Cindy, to you know Ohio and Iowa and states all over the all over the country. So. Um, soon became a widespread popular phenomenon, this idea of the pictures generation. Well, I'd also, yeah. yeah. So but I'd also that, like to make sure that we're talking about Hall Walls in Buffalo and Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, along with the Eastman House, um, you know, we're beginning to explore a lot of these ideas, which then happen as Cindy goes to New York and, and um, you know, you talked about some of those exhibitions. So I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, no, that's a great, that's a great point. In fact, Cindy came from Buffalo and had been associated with starting um, hall walls and also had shows at a photography artist space called SIPA. Yep. Um, and People from Rochester had the Visual Studies Workshop, which was very influential and important. And people would go back and forth between Buffalo and Rochester, checking each other out. It turned out that the the hall, the hall walls people all migrated to New York and sort of became important in, because of this 1977 picture show, which is why they're called Pictures Generation Artists now. Um, but there were there. There were things happening more than just in New York. A lot of the artists that are pictures generation artists had studied at the at Cal Arts in Valencia and then moved to New York after that. So there so there were a number of young artists coming from Buffalo, coming from California in the early to mid seventies that then end up making a big splash um, and become dominant artists in the eighties. Can you uh, mention a few names? Well, I'm thinking about um, Jim Welling as, as mm -hmm. a photographer that people may know about, but also um, Jack Goldstein was one of the most important figures at CalArts. Um, unfortunately, it didn't last that long, but uh, Robert Longo was at, at Hall Walls with Charles Clough and Michael Zwack, Nancy Dwyer. Um, Barbara Bloom was at CalArts. David Sally, I mean, you can you can go on and on. Mm -hmm. So um, next slide. So um, anyway, so by, by, mm -hmm. yeah, this is this is uh, this is now the end of the seven 
the end of the 80s. So, so you could say that the 80s be, became this heyday of photography. It was in the, se the center of the critical discussion. It was being shown in, you know, not just Sonnabend and Castelli, but in practically every art gallery in New York suddenly. It used to be that the galleries totally ignored photography. Now they all seem to need to show it um, a couple times a year. And, and, and it was really part of, not just part of the discussion, but it was a central part of what people wanted to talk about. Often seen as a kind of threat to painting, like they would have panels about is painting worth doing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Julian Schnabel and the whole neo-expressionist painting um, group sort of emerged out of this, out of a response to the fact that photography was starting to take some of the territory of painting. They kind of reasserted painting significance. But in any case, by the end of the 80s, with photography now being more or less naturalized within the art world, um, something unexpected happened in the political realm, which was what we now think of now called the culture wars, which was started mainly as an attack on the, the government funding art in the form of the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the agency that um, gives support to visual artists and a lot of other kinds of artists as well. So um, those who were opposed to the idea of government giving money to artists um, seized on this picture by Andre Serrano called Piss Christ, which was actually in a group show he didn't get any money from the National Endowment, but the, sh but the organization that put on the show in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, had re received money from the National Endowment. So the, se the senator from North Carolina, um, Jesse Helms, and a senator from New York State, Alphonse D'Amato, seized on this and created a huge fuss where um, not only Serrano, but also Robert Maplethorpe and David Wanarovich were all became central players, and, and it was all about their photographs being obscene, pornographic, or in this case, blasphemous, um, that, that the culture wars end up revolving to, to a large degree around photography and its seemingly singular ability to show us the forbidden. So, uh, could we have the next slide? So, so, yeah. so what was yeah. ironic about the culture wars, it, it, a not happy irony, but um, as, I, as I mentioned in the book, the, the culture wars are taking like the last, the latest entrant into the art world and using it to damn all of art. And based on photography's verisimilitude, it's the kind of veracity of photographic images. So some of the pictures that were in dispute were um, portraits by Robert Maplethorpe of two mm -hmm. children, and they happened to be nude. And so this was an era when everybody thought child pornography was running amok. So because the photographs seemed to, seemed to depict real life children, um, they, in fact, they did, but because of that, they, they were entirely objectionable. And it was this connection with the real that set off these senators, whereas in the art world, photography was more and more thought of as something that was fungible, that was you know, capable of making up stories, narratives. It was all kind of a, seen as an unreliable witness. Um, so after the culture wars, there, there was more or less a, a pressing of the reset button, and artists began to think about ways in which to sort of restore the original luster of photography. And a lot of them went back to the, the early processes of photography and, and ways of making images that were relatively um, unelaborated compared to, you know, eight by 10 view cameras or something. So this, this is an Ellen Carey picture that is of nothing, basically, some, some circles, um, some discs, uh, but it's a photogram on a Polaroid, piece of Polaroid 20 by 24 
paper. So she's actually making a photograph of something, but it's it's the not not with the camera, just with the, these objects laid on the piece of paper, what we call a photogram. So she was part of a movement that included people like Adam Foose and Susan Durgis, Gary Fabian Miller. Um, I guess I include Abelardo Morel in there that started thinking about photography's first principles and, and the ways in which photography is a material medium that reflects on its own relationship with light, I guess you would, in a nutshell, you could say that. Um, and they also become so the one of a kind of, images that yeah. are so the more idea that the reality changed, yeah. The reality of photography wasn't what was depicted so much as the, the, the way in which the material embedded something real, which was light bouncing off something. Mm -hmm. um, so in Ellen's picture, this is pretty much all you're seeing, is light bouncing off in different colors. So where do you, so that brings us up um, pretty much to the, the 90s, but where do you see photography going today? Or is that another whole uh, book that you're working on? That is a whole nother book. Originally, originally I thought I was going to write this book all the way into today, but I decided to give up when I got to the 90s because um, it was going to be way too long. But also, there's there's like a real break that's happening while these artists are making these kinds of pictures that the technology of photography is starting to fundamentally change. So, so by 1991, Adobe introduces the very first version of Photoshop, which is a way of taking digital pictures and enhancing them or manipulating them or elaborating them in some way. And, and of course, now we just know that everything goes through Photoshop. But at the time, this was thought of as, as, a, as a, almost a, a new generation of photography. People, people in the 90s were all wrapped up in talking about whether photography was a name that was still going to be used or whether we should call this imaging or electronic images or something. Um, luckily, that didn't happen. But there was, there was definitely a, a sort of tidal change of what photography was based on the way in which it was being transformed into a different technology. Um, you know, Kodak at the time was one of the most important corporations and wealthy corporations in the United States, and now it's just a pale shadow of itself, mostly because it, it couldn't get over the fact that it was a film company. Mm -hmm. um, so the lucky few who survived managed to, to uh, transition to electronic imaging. But I think since then, since the 20th century began anyway, which is when, really at the beginning of the 20th century is when digital photography becomes pretty much the replacement for film photography. Before that, it was both things were happening at the same time. Um, and 9-11 is more or less the last public event that gets photographed by photojournalists with film, which that's another story we'll talk about in the next book. Um, so anyway, so I, I just think that since the period that I talk about, Photography has maintained its status in the art world. It's not, it's not like it, it had this moment of glory and disappeared. It's actually embedded in the art world in, in ways that when I was, you know, writing in the 70s and 80s, I could have never imagined. Mm -hmm. but, but nonetheless, it's like it's what artists are interested in talking about and what photography is doing in the world is a substantially different thing. It's... it's uh, you know, billions of Instagram posts every day, and and uh, camera surveillance of of people's temperature as they walk down the street in Wuhan. I mean, it's it's just a crazy, unexpected way in which photography is is has, especially with camera camera phone cameras in phones, that photography has just become this omnipresent, inescapable fact of life. 
which is why the Museum of Photographic Arts exists. Um, the importance of helping people understand you know, visual literacy, reading, interpreting images. Um, with the change in technology, you have uh, generate a new generation of photographers that are building their own cameras, um, you know, making one of a kind images. And so, so yes, um, get to work on that next book. I think there's still so much to be said. And um, I really want to thank you for taking the time to share um, how photography became contemporary art, Andy, and looking forward to the book coming out in 2021. So it thank be you. should readily available a year from now. Yes. Hopefully sooner, but yes, definitely. And um, thank you again. And do you have anything else you want to add? No, I think you summed it up. It's like photography seems more important than ever, and which means that visual literacy and uh, the ability to understand photographs is more important than ever before. And I, I really agree with that. So thank you and be safe and Thank everyone for being part of Winescape's uh, Talks with Artists. Thank you, Andy. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Deborah. Bye. Bye-bye.